Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. I, R. Ravi, Head of Investor Relations at AGS, wishing all a very good evening and a warm welcome to the first quarter of FI21 post results conference call. To discuss the first quarter results, I am joined by Mr. Patri Sarkar, Executive Director and Chief Executive Officer, and Mr. Srinivas Parakuriti, the Global CFO. Before we begin the conference call, I would like to mention that some of the statements made during the course of the call uh, may be forward-looking in nature, including those related to the future financial and operating performance benefits and synergies of the company's strategies, future opportunities, and the growth of market of the company's services and solutions. Further, I would like to mention that some of the statements made in the today's conference call may be forward-looking in nature and may involve risk and uncertainty. Now, I would like to hand over the call uh, to Patrick Sarkar to provide his perspective on the performance for this quarter. Over to you, sir. Thank you, Ravi. A very good afternoon to all of you, and thank you for joining the call uh, today. I hope that you and your families are all safe and healthy. I would like to speak about our operational and financial performance, followed by strategic initiatives. After that, I will hand over the call to our CFO, Mr. Srinivas Palakodeti, to discuss the financial performance in greater detail. We will then open up the conference call for the Q&A session. The last five months have been extraordinary for all of us, both as individuals and as businesses. When the pandemic initially spread and the lockdowns were announced, we believed that it would be a very different, a difficult period. AGS did face a few days with challenges in delivery and reduced client volumes back in April. However, we did really well to manage the situation by shifting to the work from home model very, very quickly. Today, we are operating almost at 100% capacity and delivering services as business as usual for our clients, both from remote working and office locations where allowed. A significant part of our workforce is currently working from home. Our clients have been very appreciative of our employees' commitment to not just keep the processes operational, but also their value addition to support clients and their customers with the new challenges they are facing. I'm proud of Team AGS's performance and their pride in execution in the last few months. Coming to quarter one FY 2021, it has been a very interesting quarter for AGS. Despite the COVID-19 pandemic-led disruption to the global economic activity, AGS had a better than expected start to the current financial year in terms of revenues, profitability, and free cash flow generation. On a like-to-like -like basis, the revenues were up 8.7% for quarter one FY 2021, with EBITDA margins modestly inching up to quarter one over last year's first quarter. In quarter one FY 2020, AGS reported revenues of rupees 12,359 million, of which the past two revenues accounted for rupees 815 million, and the India domestic CRM business accounted for rupees 724 million. Due to change in contractual terms and disinvestments done, if you deduct the two from quarter one FY 2020 reported revenues, the pro forma revenue for quarter one FY 2020 works out to be 11,366 million. Hence, on a like to like basis, the revenue growth for quarter one FY 2021 works out to actually 8.7%. Of this, the currency impact would be about 7.7% and the organic growth contributed 1%. EBITDA growth to rupees 1,458 million. Debity margins improved 11.8% in quarter one FY21 from 11.6% in quarter one of last year. Debita margins improved despite lower revenue. Net profit for quarter one FY2021 improved by 21.7% over quarter one FY2020 and 9.8% over quarter four FY2020. This financial performance was a result of various factors, including higher volumes than expected, ramp ups. The board of directors at a meeting held on September 2020 approved an interim dividend of rupees six per share, as compared to the interim dividend of rupees 2.5 per share in quarter one FY 2020. This is about 20% higher on an annualized basis. Let me talk about the three key areas driving growth for us. One, our domain focus and portfolio the big advantages for AGS, resulting in minimum impact. As you all know, we are largely focused on healthcare and insurance, and we also have 
substantial exposure to customer engagement verticals, which include telecom, media, technology, banking, consumer, and retail, both in discretionary and non-discretionary segments. Each of these verticals and the sub-verticals are coping with these structural changes brought about by regulatory policies, technology changes, consumer preferences, and of late macroeconomic factors caused by the pandemic. I want to put on record that AGS has minimal exposure to hotels, tours, travel, related verticals. As a result of that, we were able to bear the storm much better than companies who've got significant exposure to these travel and tourism industries. In quarter one, FY 2021, our biggest vertical healthcare portfolio performance led by better than expected volumes in large payer clients, especially in June. The provider business did see some volume drops with some key clients, but saw good growth as well. The consumer engagement sector across key verticals in US, Canada. Uh, Mr. Sarkar, your voice is cracking in between, so we are unable to hear you clearly. Okay, is this any better? Uh, no, sir, it's still the same. Okay, there's nothing I can do. Uh, so can you uh, can you read out something again? So in quarter one FY 2021, our biggest vertical healthcare posted the strong revenue performance. Is this clearer? Yes, sir. This is better. Now you can go yes, ahead. This is better. Okay. Led by better uh, better than expected volumes in all large payer clients, especially in June. Provider business did see some volume drops with some clients, but saw good growth as well. The consumer engagement services segments saw growth across key verticals in US, Canada, UK, Jamaica, and Philippines. How is the voice now? Yes, sir, it's clear and it's clear. Now. Okay. Over the last few years, AGS has invested in strengthening our client relationships and enhancing our domain knowledge. We have long tenured partnership with most of our clients. In these times of uncertainty, this client intimacy and our expertise has provided us with competitive advantage in the market. We continue to support clients under our regular SLAs. We've also won short-term contracts away from competition who could not scale up or shift to work from home quickly for supplemental work. The COVID pandemic has given rise to several opportunities for expanding scope of work across newer activities. For example, rising COVID-19 cases has led to the decline in elective for the providers and hospitals, resulting in revenue losses and staff or lows for them. They are now looking for lower cost alternatives, which AGS can provide from its offshore location. We will continue to pursue opportunities to help clients navigate these tough times and to handhold them to structural level that's happening in the marketplace, just as we speak. Number two, winning momentum with clients. In FY 2020, we signed up with 59 new clients, including 29 core BPM services, the highest in a year. The momentum continues into quarter of 2021. We won nine clients for DPM services and five for HO payroll solution. This cut across healthcare, consumer electronics, retail, communications, oil and gas, and NGO verticals. We expanded relationship with various customer care and tech opportunity quarter. We also won contract with 11 for our digital services. The sales pipeline for all these segments, customer interaction, back office, and digital services, is looking strong from a business demand perspective. I want to mention here a cautionary message, though. The clients are very interested in deploying digital services in a bid to transform their processes. However, they are also simultaneously about the long-term engagements currently, given the uncertainty. Some of the deals that we have signed are smaller contracts, them to ramp up in coming quarters. Scalable and agile organization. We try to build a scalable and agile organization with the right skills to support our vertical and service line growth ambition. 
We now realign the organization to an integrated vertical service line structure, including leadership. This is in line with our one experience and collaborative approach strategy, which we have been driving in the past few years. Over the last five months, we have re-engineered our workflow processes for a work from everything from hiring and training new employees, to engaging clients and associates, and delivering high quality services on how to sell and transition remotely has been redesigned for a virtual distributed operating model. And this is crucial for our response to the pandemic as long as it is. The scale of the remote working model that we are driving is quite significant. For example, between April to July this year, we hired and onboarded 2,000 people globally through virtual channels, mostly for work from home roles. We've also invested in created a work at home center of excellence that focuses on sharing best practices and leverages learnings to deliver an enhanced remote working solution to clients. It includes a work home leadership university, which has so far trained 2,100 global leaders across operations. We would request the participants to stay connected as a line for Mr. Sarkar has gotten disconnected. Thank you. For, thank you for patiently waiting. We have the management reconnected, so you can go ahead, please. Sorry for that uh, interruption. Uh, we are all working from home, and networks uh, at home are not necessarily the best as we have in office, unfortunately. What I was saying is, we've created a work at home center of excellence that focuses on sharing of best practices and leveraging learnings to deliver an enhanced remote working solution to clients. It includes a work at home leadership university, which has so far trained 2,100 global leaders across operations, learning and development, recruitment, security, compliance, with the solving majority of our workforce home. To sum up, the overall state of our core business continues to be reasonably strong, and it has been further strengthened with the investment of the on a like-to-like -like basis, we have been able to report strong revenue growth for the past few years. The COVID pandemic and our work-from-home capabilities has helped us several wins in both healthcare and PS verticals. While some of the wins may be of short duration, project type in nature, we do expect several of them to convert into long-term The sales pipeline remains, especially for the healthcare vertical. We see strong demand for the open season in quarter three of FY 2021. While stay at home orders have been relaxed from some deals that we operate in, the pandemic cases continues to rise and the coming months still look uncertain. We are taking a conservative approach to shift to offices on scale based on social distancing guidelines and the need for safety measures. This means that majority of our employees will continue to work remotely for the next few months. Our goal is to continue to provide high quality services to clients despite the mode of with no disruption. In the interest of transparency, I from you, board of meeting on September 5th, 2020 has asked the company to reach the overall corporate business structure of AGS. The board has seen the is complex and needs to be simplified. The report will include relooking at the portfolio to identify gaps in our offerings and ways to bridge the gap to M&A, etc. The exercise will also review profitable businesses, loss-making contracts, and businesses which may no longer fit. The objective of this review is to see the company 
improve its performance and enhance share on completion of this exercise the board will evaluate various options implications and decide the future course of action this will be very hard hiring the consultants is required to sum up please note that we are keeping a close control on the operating costs as well as on capital and uh, expenditure despite the pandemic our free cash flow to capita uh, in quarter 1 fy 2021 was when 112% as expected in fy 2020 so any further business restructuring in the future can only can be used to prune debt provide debt covenants give us the leeway it will also create a watch for future acquisitions if necessary just to add we reported net cash of rupees 63 crores in quarter 1 fy 20 as again 73 crores of net debt in fy 2020 with that i will now hand over the call to pala to walk us through the quarter 1 fy 2021 financials and greater details thank you all once again for being with us on the call today for disruption that came because my line dropped over to you pala thank you parsa uh, are you able to hear me clearly yes a uh, very good afternoon to all the participants in the call and thank you for joining us on the Q1 FY21 post results earnings discussion as in the past we would like to start by stating for this discussion the ebitda and the ebitda margin have been computed excluding forex losses and gains which have been considered to be part of the other income as required by the auditing standards we have published our financial results as continuing operations and discontinued operations the discontinued operations refer to the india domestic crm business which we exited in in january 2020 however for the purposes of this discussion revenues profits and margins will be mentioned for the company as a whole i e aggregating continuing and discontinued operations I will start with an overview of the standalone financials. The standalone operations comprise the operations in India and the branch in Philippines. On a standalone basis for Q1 FY21, HGS reported revenues of 5,261 million, a drop of 6.3% over Q1 FY20 revenues of 5,618 million, which also included 724 million. of revenues of the india domestic business if the revenues of the india domestic business are excluded on a like to like basis q1 fy 21 revenues have increased by 7.5% over q1 fy 20 the drop in revenues coupled with costs relating to work from home led to drop in stand alone ebitda margins from of 18.6 7% in Q1 FY20 to 16.8% in Q1 FY21 other income in Q1 FY21 of 235 million rupees comprised income from sale of SEI scripts of 172 million rupees income on treasury surplus of 81 million rupees fx loss of 39 million and other items of 21 million rupees PAT for Q1 FY21 was 315 million rupees, a drop of 11.6% as compared to the PAT of rupees 357 million rupees in Q1 FY20. Now I discuss the consolidated financials of Q1 FY21. On a consolidated basis for Q1 FY21. The GS reported total revenues of 12,359 million rupees, a drop of 4.2% over Q1 FY20 of rupees 12,905 million rupees. You may recall that Q1 FY20 had passed through revenues of 815 million, and which did not accrue in Q1 FY21 due to change in the contractual terms. In addition to this, if the revenues of 724 million of the India domestic CRM business, which we exited, are excluded from Q1 FY20 revenues, for Q1 FY21, HGS revenues have grown 8.7% to 
comprising 7.8% due to exchange rate variation and around 1% due to volume growth. During Q1 FY21, HGS recorded improvement in performance in India, UK, Jamaica, and most other businesses. The profitability of the operations was impacted due to COVID-19 disruption and extra costs related to work from home being rolled out. The beta margins for Q1 FY21 on a consolidated basis has improved from 11.6% to 11.8%, an improvement of 20 basis points. The improvement in EBITDA margins by 22 basis by 20 basis points, despite the revenue drop of 4.2% on year-on-year -year basis, reflects the improvement in the mix of the system. On a consolidated basis, other income in Q1 Q1 FI 21 of 308 million rupees comprised income from sale of SEI scripts of 172 million rupees. Income on treasury surplus of 81 million rupees, forex gain of 314 million, and other items of 23 billion. PAT for Q1 FI21 was 492 million, an increase of 21.7% over Q1 FI20, and in sequential basis, a growth of 9.8% over the quarter ended March 2020. For Q1 FY21, the board of SGS has approved interim dividend of 6 rupees per share. From payout perspective, it works out to 25% of the consolidated Q1 FY21 profit, which is roughly in the same range of 24%, including dividend distribution tax of the full year FY20 consolidated PAT. This is the first full quarter post the sale of the India domestic CRM business. For Q1 FI21, healthcare vertical accounted for 56% of total revenue. Share of telecom and technology verticals stood at 14.1%, consumer and retail at 11%, and banking and financial services at 8.4%. For the quarters Q2 to Q4 of FI21, we have forward covers of around US dollar 72 million at an average USD NR rate of around 74. We also have forward covers of 73 million for our Philippines business at an average USD PHP rate of 51.6, which is significantly higher than the current USD PHP rate of 48.6. Coming to capital expenditure, during Q1 FI21, AGS incurred capital expenditure of 345 349 million rupees, which included around 43 million rupees of work from home specific capital expenditure in the form of as IT assets, assets, and other communication related items. During the quarter ended June 30th, 2020, gross debt reduced from 6,042 million rupees to 5,777 million rupees, a reduction of 265 million rupees. The debt of 5,777 5, million rupees comprises 3,759 million of debt in overseas subsidiary and 218 million rupees on the India balance sheet. The debt on the India balance sheet comprises of 1,416 million of external commercial borrowing, 600 million of working capital demand loan, and around 2 million of other working capital loans. Cash and cash equivalents of the company rose from 5,308 million to, as of 31st March 2020 to 6,406 million as of 30th June 2020, an increase of 1,097 million rupees. Take into account the short term ICDs, uh, which we are treating as treasury surplus of 3,150 million. Uh, as of 30th June, SGS has net cash of 3,779 million rupees. A bit to free cash flow conversion, which stood at 60% for FY 2020, stood at 112% in Q1 FY21, and similar to 111% in Q1 FY20. 
as on 30th June 2020, OPEX C stood at 37.8% of total C as compared to 38.3% as at 31st March 2020. Average monthly revenue per employee, which stood at 101,738 rupees for Q1 FY20, has further increased by 8.5% to 110,409 rupees in Q1 FY21. Uh, SGS in about two years back had acquired 57% stake in a company called Element, which has been renamed as SGS Digital LLC. During the quarter, sorry, during FY 2020, SGS increased its stake in SGS Digital LLC from 57% to 71.3%. In August 2020, SGS has further increased its stake to 85.66%, which denotes our continued investments and commitments for growing the digital business. I now conclude my portion and open the floor for question and answers. Thank you. Thank you very much. We will now begin the question and answer session. Anyone who wishes to ask a question may press star and one on your touchstone telephone. If you wish to remove yourself from the question queue, you may press star and two. Participants are requested to use handsets while asking a question. Ladies and gentlemen, we will wait for a moment while the question queue assembles. A reminder to the participants, anyone who wishes to ask a question may press star and one now. The first question is from the line of Siddharth Oberoi from Prudent Equity. Please go ahead. Yeah, hi. So, you know, last year, your headcount was about 45,000 uh, people. Uh, and now it is 37,165. So there's almost a, you know, seven and a half, eight thousand reduction in uh, your employees. Yeah, yet your uh, employee benefit expense is higher by 78 crores. Uh, could you explain why? Okay. Hi, uh, this is Twala here. Um, so the quarter ended March 2020. Uh, I'm sorry, quarter ended June 2009, also had employees of the India domestic business. And those uh, about close to 8,000 employees have uh, exited the company when the business got sold off in January of 2020. So that accounts, for, that helps explain the drop in the headcount. Coming to the increase in the um, it, uh, the employee expenses, what you talked about. One, you need to factor into account the exchange rate, given that you know we have significant costs overseas. And if you look at the average exchange rate for the um, quarter in the June, that was somewhere in of June of 2019, uh, the exchange rate is roughly about 69.4. And for the quarter in the June 20, it came in at about 75.4. So there is an increase of about 6,000, uh, sorry, six rupees for the dollar between quarter ended June 19 and June 20. The other point, yeah, you want, yeah, I'm sorry. Yeah, the other point which you want to make was uh, clearly is, this is the quarter where we had the impact of work from home. If this, especially in the initial period, we were um, in the process where we were, um, you know, moving out IT equipment, getting the links going, getting the uh, customer consent where required uh, in place. So obviously there was a period in that where the revenues were lower than expected, but who we had employees whom we had to pull, pay full salaries. For, because they were on the road and uh, while the work from home was being out. So you need to see the employee cost in that context 
um, uh, especially when you look at from a percentage of the earnings. So, but how many of these uh, employees do you pay in dollars uh, that they were impacted by six rupees? Yeah, so if you look at the number of employees that we have, uh, out of that 17, out of that 37,000 which we have, around 17,000 are in Philippines, are in India, and about 9,000 are in Philippines. So, about between India and Philippines, we have 27,000. And we would have, uh, you know, in between US, Jamaica, and Canada, somewhere in the range of eight to nine thousand rupees, and another 1500 people in, uh, or 16, close to 1600 people in UK. Okay. You know, also in the uh, previous concourse, we had talked about the tax rate uh, coming to about uh, 26 to 29 percent. But if we see the uh, a tax rate this time again, it is 34, 35 percent. You know, uh, why is that? So, uh, it's a slightly technical question, but let me try my best. Um, so, we have a branch in Philippines, and there is a what is called a tax sparing credit between India and Philippines. Now, in the periods when Philippines uh, performs well or as per norm, we get tax benefits uh, flowing into India. In the case, in the current quarter, uh, given the cost related to keeping work from home, uh, in the initial period, we had to arrange for uh, employees um, accommodation, boarding, so that they could stay close to the offices uh, and work, and subsequently transport uh, transportation costs incurred. The profitability of Philippines has been lower than what it should be. So clearly, that has become a, a drag on the profitability, both at the EBITDA level, and it also plays out at a tax level uh, in a different way. It's, in a way, it's like a, I mean, I hope that it helps uh, understand. No, it does not actually, actually no. It does not explain why a majority of the revenue that comes from other sources you know, at least in India, you must be paying 26%, uh, whatever business no, you think. No, we have India. some, no, it comes close to 30. Well, we do have some SEZ. Uh, those, most of them have, ex the SEZ holidays have expired. We have completed the mandatory 10-year uh, requirement. Yeah, but then still it would be, if you had moved to the 22% plus surcharge tax, surcharge uh, slab, it still comes to 26%, 25%, 26%. And if your no, no, no. modern subsidies are also sort of blended, would be still lower. No, no. Uh, let me clarify. There is a choice of moving to a uh, tax rate which is lower and give up all the concessions, or we stay with the existing re regime. As things stand, we are staying with the older regime as far as uh, taxation is concerned. Okay. So, but uh, so, what is the future thing? Is it going to remain at the 35? Are you going to actually eventually drop to you know, what others are paying, like 26, 27 percent? No, that analysis is going on because we have some SEZ which are at lower rates, and that's the international business, obviously. So, we will decide uh, during the course of this year whether we want to switch uh, to an ostensibly lower regime or stay with what we have taking into account the tax and the other accounting uh, implications. All right, okay. And also we've seen on this other income of 30 crores uh, that is yes. coming. Uh, this is uh, a forest gain? Uh, as I mentioned, it's a combination. Out of about 31 crores, there is an ex exchange gain of about uh, 3 crores. There is an interest income of about 8 crores, and there is 17 crores of income, uh, there is something called FEI scripts, uh, which we sold and we got about 17 crores of income from sale of FEI scripts. What is that? What, is, what did you mention? It's a scheme which is there from the government, where okay. for if you are exporting, uh, if you do export of services, uh, you get certain incentives, uh, which you can avail or you m monetize. So we have one. Okay. okay, so this is not recurring, right? It's 17 crores. This is a one time. No, no. Yeah, yeah. There is a backlog. So you have to apply, get benefits, and then you sell. Yes. So, 
So, no, but my point is, is this for just this quarter or is this going to accrue in the subsequent quarters? No, no, it, it cannot accrue every quarter because it is all pertaining to for a particular financial year. All right. Okay. Or I'll come back in the queue then. Thank you, Sula. Thank you. Thank you. We would request the participants to please press star and 1 to ask a question. The next question is from the line of Manvardhan Bet from Laurel Capital Partners. Please go ahead. Good evening. Uh, thank you for the opportunity. Uh, can you uh, share with us uh, some more details about the restructuring uh, that you have thought about and uh, uh, sort of uh, give us some context or maybe some immediate areas that you've already identified which needs to be addressed? Um, so let me take that question. Um, see, on an ongoing basis, we have been reviewing our portfolio of businesses, and board has asked the company to review the overall corporate and business structure. Uh, we do have a fairly complex structure with a number of foreign subsidiaries and holding companies. So we are looking at that and seeing what can be simplified. We are also looking at um, what are the gaps in our existing offerings and way to bridge the gap to mergers or acquisitions, and if possible, even if necessary, even divestments for unprofitable businesses or businesses which are not necessarily the strategic fit of the business right now. So our departure, our divestment for the India domestic business was step one of that plan, and we got. Uh, uh, suspended because of the pandemic. Uh, so it's a little privilege to talk more specific. The idea is to make the company stronger, improve its performance, and enhance, enhance shareholder value. And that's an exercise that's been kicked off now. Uh, when we have more details, we'll share. Right now, there isn't more detail available. Um, if you could also update about the performance of Access Point in this particular quarter. Allah, you want to take that question? Yeah. So <clears throat> we continue to work on improving the performance of uh, Access Point. Uh, there will be two tracks. One is on the cost reduction. Other is in terms of uh, growing revenue. So our efforts there uh, continue. Uh, while for the quarter ended June of uh, 2019, uh, Access Point had a EBITDA loss of about 1.89 million. Uh, that came down by about a third, so it, the loss for the quarter was about 1.25 million. Uh Sort of just also, if you could update us on the outstanding uh, ICDs to the parent group uh, in this quarter, where do they stand? So, as of 31st March, it was 340 crores. Uh, as of 30th June, it reduced to 315 crores. And today, as we speak, it is in, it's about 215 crores. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. The next question is from the line of Satish Kumar Chandra, individual investor. Please go ahead. Hello. Hello. Yes, Mr. Hello, Satish. Satish. Yes, sir, you can go ahead, please. Satish, sir, your line is in talk mode. You can go ahead. You can hear me now? Yes, sir. Yeah. Uh, thank you for this opportunity to ask questions. And uh, the excellent performance in the Q1 during this difficult time is commendable. But one question which is lingering in my mind as a common shareholder is, why there is a delay in publishing your results? Because companies like uh, TCS or Infosys, who have got thousands of uh, arms, smaller divisions, they are able to consolidate, consolidate their results much earlier. So what is the problem there the company is facing? So, uh, 
that's a very good question and we are looking at how we can improve processes remote working is causing a certain amount of uh, you know uh, road block in consolidated account consolidating accounts quickly uh, we took a long time for the last quarter this quarter we have uh, we tried and uh, quarter two again we'll try to improve but very good feedback i agree with you we are working hard to make sure that we can uh, announce as also earlier because that's all about the image of the organization okay because that sends out a wrong signal to the customers that the yeah yeah so i think uh, you will uh, go ahead and improve it yeah. we'll try it with that lot. quarter that's all good thank you sir thank you a reminder to the participants anyone who wishes to ask a question may press star and one now the next question is from the line of siddharth obroy from prudent equity please go ahead yeah, so this is uh, regarding the answer on the previous uh, question uh, you said what is the pending icd is it, has it increased now <laughs> no i said it was 340 crores as of 31st of march as of 30th of june it was 315 crores and as of date it is 215 crores okay two one for the reduction of 100 crores all right okay uh, also you know the uh, you know the ebit uh, is about 13 point uh, something percent you know so mm-hmm. although you don't give forward guidance you know is it possible in this kind of a business to achieve 16 17 percent ebit margin on a fairly consistent basis i mean as you said we can't give guidance so our ob- objective is really to improve from an operational performance and as partha mentioned earlier um you know the one of the uh, objectives of this exercise which we talked about is also to see is there a business some or which is no longer strategic which is having a financial or having a financial performance and see if uh, such a diversification would make sense to improve the overall profitability of the business right so so maybe when you restructure uh you know is is my only point is is the 16 17% even possible in 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 your kind of a vertical some of your competitors are doing that a bit of a theor- yeah the theoretical and the answer is clearly yes it is possible we have a business we have some businesses you know which are low margin but high return because it, so when you look at the business purely from a margin perspective you will have that kind of uh, a problem as well because it optically it will still it gets consolidated and you don't get to see the fact that it has got a high roc so that's the whole purpose of this portfolio review thing okay you yeah, regarding this cost reduction you know are you renegotiating these uh, uh, because a lot of uh, expenses were in uh, you know uh, these cost uh, rentals yeah so wherever possible we have been able to get concession um in terms of reduction in lease rentals um yeah so that is an ongoing uh, gesture uh, exercise but we have not given up any leases if that's your question so but uh, since everyone is moving to work to home uh, do you find the reason to you know hold on to these leases uh, maybe probably prepay something penalty or something and cancel them would be more uh, you know prudent i mean we don't know how long this would last and it also depends we've got uh, specific clearances to work from home if the client want us to you know uh, subject to the uh, other things being allowed if the client wants us to move back to work from home that is something we have to uh, look at and not rule out okay but as of now you won't be able to quantify the savings that can accrue from this no it's difficult to say that right now not even in percentage maybe some some no i you know no i don't have, you know if i give you a number that would be misleading so it's better that i don't uh, give you a number 
All right. Okay, so this is one question uh, regarding revenue. Uh, one of your you know, listed competitors has come out with a 10% guidance uh, growth. Are you seeing any such thing where you can uh, where you can confidently say that this year, from the 5,000 crore revenue last year, there can be some kind of a growth, or is it just retention for the year? Uh, well, uh, we don't give guidance, uh, uh, so that's the problem. But we will see growth. I won't be able to quantify it from the number. And that, growth. of course, you have to understand the growth will come. You will have to actually do some computation so to reach at the net growth because. You have to understand last year we had a full year of India domestic business, which has been divested, right? So those revenues are not going to come. So whatever growth happens will be on top of that. So there will be a dip on account of the divesture. On top of that will come organic growth. Do you understand my uh, answer? Yeah, yeah, I got the point, yeah. But uh, so with the uh, divesture, it was expected that the margins would actually uh, shoot up. But uh, what we are seeing is that uh, the margin profile remains almost the same. Uh, while the revenues is also kind of retained, which is good that you kind of retain the same revenue, but the margin profile is uh, very flat. Well, we expect it to improve. Uh, it's just been a quarter which has been completely roiled by our cost of setting up a work from home. It's been a significant startup cost for work from home, which uh, you have to understand has been very disruptive for our industry. So you're seeing all the costs for that coming into quarter one. Okay, so so we can expect some kind of a you know reduction there as well. Yeah, I think we should yeah, wait for so. a full year performance to yeah, assess the exactly. profitability. All right. Okay, so and you know this last question I have on this uh, you know the the loans uh, you know the things were given to promoters. So uh, 215 is left, which has come down quite a lot. Is there a timeline for you know uh, getting the whole thing back? We the loans are on uh, loans are on call, okay. And I'll give you a little bit of a background. There was a lot of concern raised in the earlier call, so let me give you the background. Quarter four, we had a root shock. A significant uh, chunk of our uh, surplus funds were parked with a private sector bank, which was in the eye of a storm, and uh, that those funds were frozen. So that was a very bad shock that we received, and that's when this thought about uh, working on ICDs came on. What do you look for when you have a surplus cash, which we have today? You look for safety, liquidity, and return. And from all these perspectives, we realize that when it is Hinduja Group backing it up, with the promoters themselves being 67 shareholders of Hinduja of AGS, so far as safety is concerned, we were pretty sure of that. So far as liquidity is concerned, these are short-term deposits can be called at any point of time. And so far as returns concerned, the returns are much higher than average return that you can get. From these perspectives, these loans were given. However, it's not something that's going to be there for good. We are working on, into, on reducing the RCDs on a significant basis, and uh, you will see that uh, reduce as a, as a number going forward. So you know, in terms of capital allocation, the now that you this money is coming back and you're generating, uh, you know, so much free cash flow, is there any plan to you know prepay some of these uh, 577 crores of gross debt, uh, you know, prepay it or you know, where reduce the uh, interest cost? Well, there are some conditions for prepayment. Pala can cover you can cover it. Most of these are term loans, so there is cost of prepayment, uh, which may not be that attractive as an option. We've increased dividend. You would have noticed that. But anyway, Pala, you can address this question. You know, there is a 70 crores of uh, working capital, you know, those can be probably addressed. Pala, you can take that question. Pala? I think Pala has dropped off. Um, so yeah, so need... let me answer on, sorry, is Pala there on the line? Yes, sir, we have so connected. Okay, Pala, do you hear the question? Srinivasa, I would request you to please unmute yourself if muted from the handset. Uh, sir, the line dropped for uh, Srinivasa. We would request you to please stay connected while we join sir back. Okay. We are going to peruse the working process.
Thank you for patiently waiting. We have Srinivas sir connected, so you can go ahead, please. My apologies. The landline also dropped. <coughs> you got it. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah, part of the question uh, was, can we repay some of our term loans with the excess cash that we had? So I, uh, while I explained why the background behind why the ICDs were done and all of that, and the fact that we are uh, collecting the money back as we go through the year, uh, would you take up the question on repaying the loans that we have uh, instead of putting the money in ICDs? Yeah. So most of the loans, uh, I mean, the, the surpluses are in India. And those bulk of the loan is in the form of a external commercial borrowing. Now, as per RBI guidelines, loan repayment, uh, the ACB outstanding which we have is roughly uh, uh, about 142 crores. And that loan typically, which is in, in the form of an ECB, cannot be repaid um, as per RBI guidelines. So that's the challenge that we have. And as we mentioned um, in the earlier call, today if I take working capital financing, um, the first 60% has to be in the form of a working capital demand loan uh, with a fixed minimum repayment period of 15 days or 30 days. What That may vary from bank to bank. So if I, let's say, borrow on the 15th of June, and even if I had the cash surplus and I would not be able to repay the loan, uh, if the period of the loan is about, it's a, it's a 30 days, then I cannot repay before uh, 15th of July. Okay, but uh, out of 577 crore, 142 is ECB, but there's another 435 crores. My point is that you're yeah. generating so much free cash right now. Uh, uh, and is yeah, there a way you can... Consolidated level, yes, I agree, we are generating cash. But these other prepayment, I mean, on the other loans, uh, they may come with, uh, you know, prepayment penalty. Okay. So, so okay, all right. So, so, but what, what about this money that is coming back from the ICDs? Uh, where are you parking them now? Yeah. So, you know, those are being deployed in sense. Uh, they say if, if there's a, nothing else, we will put them in the deposits with the bank. And bear in mind, these are all short-term surpluses, as we mentioned earlier as well as today. Uh, we are doing a review of what is our what are our offerings, where are the gaps, what do we build, what do we acquire. So we expect this to be deployed for M&A uh, going forward. Okay, but uh, you know the last two uh, acquisitions didn't pan out very well, or in fact, they didn't you know turn around till now. So if you can, I hope you are cautious of that. Absolutely. Yeah. So yeah. that is actually not correct. Uh, the digital acquisition has done really well. Elegant Solution has done really well. It is the access point uh, acquisition that has not done well. And yeah, we will be very cautious when we look at M&A targets. Yeah. All right. Okay. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. The next question is from the line of Rusni Koza from Kodak Securities. Please go ahead. Uh, I just want to understand since last quarter got impacted because of this global pandemic, what could be the blended utilization levels in the last quarter and what it is as it now as of now? You're talking about manpower utilization? Yes. Yes. Manpower. See, manpower, we don't carry a bench, sir. So uh, unlike IT companies who carry a bench, uh, our utilizations are almost everybody who is hired is, uh, works unless they are going through a training. So uh, utilization would be very, very high. Okay. okay. I, just, I'm, I was just trying to understand, is there a, a, a positive impact this quarter as compared to last quarter because maybe the business got impacted last quarter and we had only 1.1% uh, growth in terms of excluding the forex gain. So could there be some some impact, positive impact coming in this quarter as compared to last quarter? Yeah, see, you're very right. What happened was in the first month in April, actually we struggled to make people productive, uh, especially in Philippines. So in the Philippines, we actually were paying people without being able to get them to go to work, get them productive. 
So that situation has improved significantly now. Through June and July and August, we've been able to make most of Philippines enabled on work from home basis. So as a result of that, the utilization has actually improved in quarter two because people are not sitting idle. We are, they are able to do work. But both of April and May, mostly in Philippines, we had significantly low utilization because we were not able to deploy people on work from home that effectively as we were able to do in other countries. In India, we were able to do fine. Jamaica, we were able to do fine. US, Canada, UK, all these geographies we were able to do really, really quickly. But Philippines, we had some struggles in April and May. But that's behind us. So from that perspective, utilization in quarter two will be better. Okay. Uh, that's it from my side, sir. Best of luck for the future quarters. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. The next question is from the line of Sri Vallabhaiya, an individual investor. Please go ahead. Hello, sir. Uh, uh, in the opening uh, remark, Ms. Pala had said that right uh, uh, last uh, year also you have distributed 25% of the profits, and this quarter, this uh, quarter also you are uh, distributing about 25% of the profits. So, what will be the policy going forward? Because you'll be having surplus cash flow coming back from ICD also. Are you going to improve on this 25% disbursement, or is it going to remain like this, or uh, some other policy? It's a good question. Uh, uh, now, there is too many uncertainties right now, sir. Uh, in this situation, cash conservation is most important for us. So we will definitely uh, have a hard look at what kind of cash we are generating. And we will try to maintain the dividends that we have paid in quarter one. Whether we can increase or not, it's a little premature right now to say. We have to see how the second half of the year pans out, sir. So the line for the current participant dropped. As there are no further questions, I would now like to hand the conference over to Mr. R. Ravi for closing comments. Thank you, uh, Again, Ravi here. Thank you to all the participants for joining us in the post results conference call. If there are any further questions or clarifications about the Q1FI21 results, please email me or to Pala, the CFO, and we'll be more than happy to get back to you. This is Ravi signing up on behalf of the NGA panel. Once again, thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you for joining us. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you very much.